the sole educator. I'm an educator, graphic designer, media artist, cultural critic, and I have an Instagram platform that does a lot of racial justice work online. Um, originally, I'm from Orange County, California, and I completed my undergraduate degree at University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, I studied ecology and evolution and biological anthropology. And then after that, I went to University of Washington um, and I studied public health with an emphasis in environmental health. And so after I did that, I came, I worked in a domestic violence shelter. I did a lot of other community work and then I came back to California and I'm currently working at Just Communities. So that's a little bit of background on myself. And so I would also like to start with a brief um, land acknowledgement and so I'm currently, like I said, in Santa Barbara, California, and Santa Barbara is located on the unceded Chumash and Smoowich land. Um, the Santa Barbara Mission, one of the most visited tourist attractions in the area, is the site of genocide, forced conversion, and colonization of our Chumash and Smoowich siblings. The missions paved the way for the creation of the United States and aided in the enslavement of Indigenous American and Black slash African peoples. And land acknowledgments are tricky. <laughs> They're very tricky things to do because especially with an organization like the Marine Protected Areas Collaborative Network, we are up and down the coast right now. So I can only acknowledge the land that I am currently on, but I would like to acknowledge that all of Turtle Island is stolen and unceded land of Indigenous peoples, regardless of where we're located within Turtle Island. This all belongs to Indigenous peoples. The problem with land acknowledgments, though, is that it tends to make it seemed like indigenous peoples are in the past, like they're not currently here living with us, occupying this land as well. And so I wanted to bring in some other perspectives on land acknowledgement. And this is from Robbie Richardson. Um, this is a brief excerpt from their essay titled Some Observations on Decolonizing the University. Um, and this was pulled from Anti-Racism in the Contemporary University from the LA Review of Books. So I'll just read this particular perspective on it. And so it says most institutions now offer land acknowledgements. This is the practice that has existed in some form among indigenous nations for a long time, but which has spread rapidly in the non-indigenous world. At an online conference I recently attended, the majority of speakers offered their own land acknowledgements, attempting to address historical asymmetries and dispossessions, even speakers from outside North America. In Canada, where this practice has existed for longer and has become thoroughly entrenched, many Native people have come to see such gestures as self-congratulatory and empty. Personally, I have very mixed feelings, but my misgivings largely stem from the absence of Indigenous people in the crafting or delivery. Who is, it, who is this acknowledgement for? Who will hear it? And what gives the speaker the right to evoke a relationship with people about whom they know very little in the present tense? Further, to what extent do these acknowledgements perform the very act they are intending to interrupt? The relegation of both colonialism and indigenous sovereignty to the past and the assumption that healing can begin based on a supposedly new relationship without any implications for the speaker. And so I wanted to bring in this particular perspective because as a black person, I always struggle with how best to tackle this sort of land acknowledgement at the beginning of talks because I, would, I feel similarly when people sometimes make acknowledgements towards the black community and do gestures that I think sometimes can feel performative without building any sort of real relationship with the peoples that you're speaking about. And so I just wanted to make sure that I brought that in here, but I didn't want to continue my talk without acknowledging the genocide that took place on the land that I'm currently on today. So um, like I said, I work for Just Communities and our mission is that Just Communities believes in a world free of white supremacy, xenophobia and racism. We build awareness, provide education and equip black indigenous people of color and co-conspirators with the tools necessary to take action towards a racially just future. And so Just Communities has a lot of core values that we are currently building up. You can read them on our website, but essentially our core values believe that racism is foundational to everything. There's, I have a lot of um, trouble talking about this, especially with people who are in fields that don't study race. <laughs> and I use quotes because race is a part of everything where people will say like, oh, can you bring race into this aspect or bring race into that aspect? And I'm like, race is already entrenched in every single thing that we do, especially in the United States. And so because I come from a science background, it always seemed like it was you do science or you talk about race and not that it was really embedded together. And so that's why I get excited to do talks like this because I can talk about how racism has in shaped and influenced our very understanding of science and how we practice science, how we do science, how we interact with the natural world around us. And so that is really integral to the mission of Just Communities is first understanding how race 
has sort of warped our view and interactions with the world around us and each other. So the first thing that I wanted to ground us in is this model, which is based off of the social ecological model that some of you might be familiar with. It's pretty common in public health, but this is like adapted a little bit. Um, so this comes from generative somatics, and I was first introduced to this particular version of the social ecological model from Stacey K. Haynes in her book, The Politics of Trauma. And so essentially the way that this model works is that you look at the sort of bigger concentric circles going out and these concentric circles talk about our sites of shaping. What are the things and the forces in our life that shape our belief systems, our behaviors, our actions, our views of the world, et cetera. And so the idea is the larger the circle, the harder it is to shift and change those things or the more people you need to work with to shift and change things. So you start at the individual level, it builds out to the family, community, institutions, social norms and historical forces, and then spirit and landscape. All of these are sort of interplaying within each other. And so when we talk about in order to change things, the bigger the circle, the more people you need. If you're going to change an institution, one person cannot change an institution. You need a collective effort to change an institution. One person cannot change a community. You need a collective effort to do such. And like the bigger the circle, the more people need to be involved to really shift and change that. But today I'm primarily gonna focus on social norms and historical forces and give a little bit of background. We're gonna dive into colonialism, talk about some key terms and go forward. But I just wanted you all to be grounded in what part of this whole map of the world I'm focusing on today. So I wanted to start us off with a quote from Marcus Garvey. For those of you who don't know, Marcus Garvey is a brilliant Pan-Africanist, was a brilliant Pan-Africanist, um, very instrumental in Black liberation movements um, and the connection between Black people and the, throughout the diaspora. So that means the Americas, the Caribbean, um, West Africa, and beyond. And so he, in this quote, says, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without its roots. So right now in the United States, we have a lot of pushback against this so-called concept of critical race theory and this idea, which in the US is really boiled down to, we don't really wanna talk about the very real brutal racist history of this country. That is something that I don't shy away from. And I wanted to ground this in this Marcus Garvey quote because you cannot move forward unless you understand your past. And I'm someone who's very big on understanding who my ancestors are, I'm currently, training to become a priestess in a tradition that was denied to me because of the history of enslavement and colonization of my peoples. And that's something that's really integral to shaping my identity and the work that I do going forward. And so I wanted to take this presentation and this workshop for us to really dive into this. If I was going to do this in a small group setting, there would have been a little bit of a pre-work assignment. Y'all would have had a chance to think about your own background and how your ancestors contributed to the legacy of the United States. But because we don't have that opportunity to do that, I just wanted to make sure that we at least briefly touched on it here with this quote from Marcus Garvey. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is environmental colonialism. And so before we even do that, why are we talking about colonization? What is the point? So Rupa Myra is a, an incredible scientist. She's a doctor and she's a social justice advocate. I just picked up her book the other day called Inflamed and I'm really excited to dive into that. But she really looks at the connection between trauma and how trauma shows up in terms of like uh, the social determinants of health in the healthcare system and connecting it to larger systems of oppression. So this is where this infographic comes from. It was adapted slightly, but it's essentially the same infographic that Rupa Myra came up with. And so at the top, you have colonization, which is sort of this overarching political phenomenon. And underneath that, you have supremacy and capitalism. And branching off from both of those is essentially sums up a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in our modern era. White supremacy, male patriarchy, human supremacy, which is leading to ecocide and the sort of destruction of the environment, which is connected again to capitalism. That is really the snapshot of what we're going to focus on today is how all of these things feed into ecocide and the destruction of the environment. But I wanted to root us in this particular infographic so that we understand why colonization is central to the work that we that you all do at MPA and the teachings and educations that we do at Just Communities. So what is colonialism? Colonialism is the dominance and subjugation of one group by another for the purpose of economic exploitation. 
Colonialism usually happens in tandem with imperialism, and the key players in colonial regi regimes tend to be, and this is a quote from Ami Césaire, the adventurer and the pirate, the wholesale grocer and the ship owner, the gold digger and the merchant, appetite and force. Colonialism typically involves the invasion or military occupation of one nation by another, and it can also include predatory loans and fabricated debt in the example of France's re economic relations with Haiti and West Africa. So I have an image on this slide of a bunch of men surrounded by a lot of objects. Hopefully you all can kind of see this on your screen. This is the looting of art and artifacts from West Africa. So this image is from the British Museum and that's why the British Museum exists essentially is because the colonization of all of these different places in the world. So it's in this particular image, you have all of these art pieces, which are actually pieces that are culturally and spiritually significant to peoples from West Africa. It looks like based on what I'm seeing in the images that this is from Ghana specifically. And so all of these artifacts are now housed in the British Museum and European museums around the world right now. And so there's a really famous quote from this particular Nigerian artist who says, the only way that Africans can see their own art is to go to Europe. Like we can't even see our own art in West Africa. And so that's just one tiny piece of the violence that colonialism subjects different indigenous peoples to around the world. And so I just wanted to have this image on here because I think that it's such a, a stark visual of like the sort of theft that colonialism is. And so what sort of set off this whole colonization land grab adventure, for lack of a better word, into the Americas and West Africa and around the world. Well, there's two documents that kind of go under this overarching description of the doctrine of discovery, but it's actually two different papal bulls at two different times. So the first one was in 1455, and it was called the Romanus Pontifex. It was signed by Pope Nicholas V, and this basically granted the Portuguese up for grabs, all of Africa's up for grabs for the Portuguese, and that was in 1455. Um, essentially, the justification was that they were not Christian peoples, and so therefore basically not human peoples, and that they could just take whatever they wanted. And so they framed it as like a mission to spread Christianity throughout the continent. And so Congo in West Africa, which is now the region where the Kingdom of Congo was, is Angola on the western coast of Africa, was the first place to be converted to Christianity in West Africa. And so the Catholic Church comes in, they convert a bunch of folks to Christianity, and then the slave trade begins shortly thereafter. So this whole process really kicks off in 1455 up and down the Western coast of Africa with Portugal. Um, in 1493, one year after Christopher Columbus lands in the Americas, you have what is the document that we typically know as the Doctrine of Discovery, but it's actually called Inter Catera. And it was another papal bull, this time signed by Pope Alexander the Sixth. And this is basically justifying the Christian expansion of the world. They don't just limit it to the Americas. They say all non-Christian lands in the entire world are essentially up for grabs for European powers. That opens up the entirety of Africa, all of the Americas, most of Asia, all of that world is essentially peoples that are not worthy of their own self-determination because these are heathens, these are backwards peoples, these are peoples who don't have hundreds and hundreds of years of knowledge according to the Catholic Church, right? And so that these two documents are very instrumental in creating the colonial regimes and the, the foundation of the United States as we know it today. So why do I bring up the doctrine of discovery? Is it still relevant today? It is because in 2005, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually used the doctrine of discovery to argue that indigenous peoples did not have right to land. And I believe it was in New York. She, she used it as proof like, oh, you don't actually have right to this land. And I'm going to cite the doctrine of discovery to justify that. So it's very much relevant. This document is still alive and well. And if it wasn't relevant, we wouldn't be here in the United States today because we are here because of this document. So this image is illustrating the colonization of Congo. Like I said, this really started in 1455. But missionaries converted Congo in about 1480 to Catholicism. Um, there's a lot of, I'm like a religious scholar also, and there's like a lot of really interesting um, things that you see come out of this Christianization of the Congo, but I'm not going to dive into that today. Um, but yeah, this is basically what happens. And it's important to ground us in this fact that Congo was colonized in 1480 because 
by the 1500s, as soon as the Europeans land in the Americas, they start bringing enslaved Africans with them. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, which talks about how the British brought the first enslaved Africans to the America, to um, North America, I should say, in 1619. But some Black scholars have actually pushed back on that project because they're saying we've been in the Americas even longer than that. Like we might not have been in the British colonies within North America, but the Spanish and the Portuguese had been transporting enslaved Africans since about 1500. And so those first Africans that do end up landing in the Americas are actually Christian because they came from Congo and had been um, converted to Catholicism for about 100 years at that point. So that's just like an interesting illustration of the ways that colonization is shaping the landscape of both the Americas, West Africa, and Europe. And so, like I said, Congo was colonized, and then shortly thereafter, the Americas were colonized. And you see this image essentially of them bringing the cross to indigenous peoples of this land, right? And so, like I said, this these two pronged colonization this creates the transatlantic slave trade. I want to ground us in the beginning of this because this is going to be very important as we dive into environmental colonization in a little bit, is the formation of the transatlantic slave trade. Europeans go into Africa, then they go to the Americas and they keep transporting people back and forth, right? This is the beginning of the world that we now know today, is this exchange of goods and people and ideas and beliefs um, in a very violent way that subjugates indigenous and black people and relegates them not even as second class citizens, but essentially as non human people. And that's very important to ground us in because as soon as this takes off, we start to see the environmental collapse of the Americas and West Africa. So this image is illustrating the transatlantic slave trade a little bit better. Um, and so you can see West Africa, that really thick arrow at the bottom where it says West Central Africa, if you can all see that on your screen, that is where the modern day country of Angola, where the um, pre-colonial nation of Congo existed. So that is the first place where West Africans were converted to Catholicism in mass and then sort of transported throughout the Americas. So this fundamentally reshapes both the African continent and the continent of the Americas as well. And so you see this arrow sort of be thick from the Congo and other parts of West Africa and thin out throughout. The vast majority of Africans actually end up in Latin America. So only a couple hundred thousand of enslaved Africans go to the United States. I think about 5% of all enslaved Africans end up in the United States. 95% of them are actually in Latin America. And this reshapes the entire um, economic system, social system, cultural, religious, political, et cetera, systems of all of these three parts of the world. This really is the beginning of global trade. And so because global trade has destroyed the environment so much, we have to understand its roots in genocide and enslavement and violence against black people and violence against indigenous people. And so um, what I really wanted people to understand with this graphic image of the transatlantic slave trade is that 12.5 million enslaved Africans make it across the Atlantic. About 2 million of them drown in the Atlantic Ocean and then they're dispersed throughout. So when you take 12.5 million people out of various parts, and those are just the ones that make it onto ships that we have a rough count of, right? So there's families torn apart. There are communities that are decimated. What does that do to the ecosystem? What does that do to the economy of West Africa? And then when you transport all those people to the Americas, you're also contributing to the genocide of indigenous peoples. You're pushing them out at the same time that you're bringing in Africans to work um, on plantations and to be enslaved on this land. And so what does that do to the economy and the ecosystem of the Americas? Because there were, I believe like 80 million indigenous Americans at one point. What happens to all of those people when they are brutally exterminated by this colonial regime? What happens to the ecosystem? We're going to touch on that in a little bit. So what is white supremacy? White supremacy is the systematic discrimination, violence, genocide, and oppression of all non-white people for the economic benefit of Western Europeans. 
White supremacy is a global system of domination that places Western Europeans, Anglos, at the top of a racial hierarchy over all other white people like Eastern Europeans, folks from West Asia and North Africa, Jewish folks, multiracial white people, white folks from Latin America, and above all black people and people of color. So if I had um, a little bit more time and the ability to work with you all in a small group, I would show you a really quick clip from Bell Hooks. Um, Bell Hooks is an incredible writer. She recently passed away and there's a very um, great video of her explaining why she uses the term white supremacy and why she doesn't use the term racism. So white supremacy specifically talks about this idea of striving towards whiteness that other people of color also do as well. Racism is too one dimensional and flattening and it doesn't really highlight the complexity of our interactions with each other. But it's about striving towards this idea of whiteness that was established by a Protestant um, Western European vision of what perfection and beauty and intellect was. That is the system of white supremacy and the rest of the world is sort of beholden to this system and operating in different ways so they can essentially strive to be what Western Europe deems is correct or respectable. That's this concept of white supremacy. And so you really see this kick off with, like I said, the transatlantic slave trade, but throughout the, the 1700s as well, you get a lot of like race science sort of starting to come out, a lot of like the roots of eugenics coming out of this era. So I believe in like 1776, you have Johann Blumenbach, who basically, um, categorizes our modern understanding of what race is. He divides people up into different categories by looking at their skulls. He collected skulls of people from around the world. And he said that the skull from Georgia was the prettiest one. And so therefore people are white. <laughs> that's, that's how race came to be in our modern era. There's lots of other people, but Johann Blumenbach was one of the most famous ones. And so it's this concept and idea that whiteness is always the best and that everybody else should be striving to be as close to whiteness as possible. And the people who are closer to whiteness are better than the ones who are farther from whiteness, AKA black folks and other indigenous peoples. Um, now we're going to talk about the concept of the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is a proposed geological epoch dating from the commencement of significant human impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems, including but not limited to anthropogenic climate change. Sometimes it's referred to as the Capitolocene, um, which is this era marked by the role of capitalism and the Industrial Revolution and how it played in the destruction of global ecosystems, climate change, and the social and cultural impacts of both. So Anthropocene, white supremacy, how are they connected to each other? They're connected to each other by this idea of environmental colonialism. And so environmental colonialism challenges the idea that the Anthropocene began with the Industrial Revolution, and it argues that its true beginning is with the colonization of the Americas. European colonization of the Americas established global trade routes between Europe, West Africa, and the Americas transporting millions of Africans, as well as flora and fauna from Africa. So cotton, rice, indigo, coffee, black-eyed peas, okra, and flora from the Americas, corn, chocolate, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, invasive species were introduced with foreign diseases that killed over 50 million indigenous Americans. Colonizers decimated indigenous flora and fauna like buffalo and the salmon and prevented indigenous peoples from traditional land management like regulated burns in California. This is when we start to see the environment degrade is at the onset of the transatlantic slave trade. This is the argument that environmental colonialism is trying to make. Typically, because of our lack of wanting to talk about the very real nature of colonization and how it served a purpose of making Europeans and white folks wealthier than the rest of the world, people don't really want to talk about how colonization is really the beginning of environmental degradation. But it is, because when you start transporting cotton and rice and indigo and coffee to places that it wasn't, you're going to reshape the environment. They're not indigenous to those places. And when you start taking corn, chocolate, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and putting them in other parts of the world as well, it's going to fundamentally reshape the environment. When you move and murder millions and millions of people around the world, that's going to fundamentally change the environment. And when those people who have been taking care of the world around them for thousands and thousands of years, like as a black person, it's kind of wild to think about that. The first people came from Africa. Like my ancestors have been taking care of the African continent for like 200,000 years. 
when you remove those very entrenched systems of land management, of interacting with um, the world around them, of interacting with the oceans and the coastal systems, when you remove that knowledge and mix all of those people around the world, you're going to see environmental collapse. That's the argument of environmental colonialism. So this is pulled from an article in The Guardian um, from 2018, and it talks specifically about environmental colonialism. And it says, sorry, the little zoom bars in the way. Oopsie. It says, um, the European arrival in particular, the British and Spanish, had profound impact on Central and Southern America, Maslin told the observer. They carried germs for smallpox, measles, flu, typhoid, and many other diseases that led to the deaths of more than 50 million Americans who had no previous exposure to these pathogens. Within a few decades, society in America collapsed and subsistence farming there was wiped out. Forests returned to the land, forests returned to land that had been abandoned by humans. We can detect this is an Antarctic ice cores. We can we, sorry, we can detect this in Antarctic ice cores, added Maslin. These provide a history of the atmosphere for thousands of years and show carbon dioxide levels reached a distinct minimum around 1610 because forests, which are much better than farm crops at absorbing carbon dioxide, were now covering vastly increased areas of the American landscape thanks to the eradication of the people who had once farmed there. This effect continued for decades until America's population of humans was restored. This is the marker in 1610 that really defines the Anthropocene, argue Lewis and Maslin, and it was not just the movement of pathogens by co colonialists that triggered this event. So did plants and animals. So essentially they're talking about how the genocide of millions of indigenous peoples fundamentally reshaped the ecosystems here in North America. And so their argument is, no, it didn't happen with the Industrial Revolution, which takes place in the late 1700s, early 1800s. This happened in 1610, 200 years prior. We start to see the environment fundamentally shifting because of actions that humans are taking. And so this plays out across the United States in this concept known as manifest destiny, this idea that this is God given land, it's our right to be here. And what happens when the settlers spread out across the United States is I feel like captured pretty well in this picture. Um, so you see different people coming through and like um, you have people in wagons and people farming the land. But if you like really look at all of the different elements of the picture, you see railroads cutting through the land, you see um, forests being decimated for different types of farmland, and then you see indigenous folks in Buffalo running away. Um, colonizers decimated Buffalo populations in the United States, decimated indigenous populations, um, polluted rivers and streams, um, mined for coal in areas where coal should not have been mined for. All of this destroyed the land and this sort of concept to expand the West, to conquer the wilderness. Um, there's, when I do this workshop in a small group, there's a video that I show from Schoolhouse Rock actually that talks about Manifest Destiny. And I play it to talk about the ways that we're taught this history in, the, in um, the United States in a way that is very sanitizing. And so in the Schoolhouse Rock video, they describe it as elbow room. They said that there was just, it was getting a little too crowded on the East Coast and all of the colonizers needed a little bit of elbow room. And so they just spread out and it was like A-OK. -okay, and they just walked out to the wilderness and they conquered it and everything was great and perfect. So I, I wanted to ground us in this idea that that's not the reality of what happened. It was very violent. It was very intentional, decimating buffalo populations and um, different wildlife populations was an intentional way to harm indigenous communities and to sever their relationship to land, the reservation system, forced relocation. All of this was intentionally designed to remove indigenous peoples from the land, to sever their connection or attempt to sever their connection from the land, to establish what white folks wanted in this in the United States, right? And so this is these moments throughout history are what's really shaping and reshaping the environment. It doesn't like the Industrial Revolution is the logical trajectory from this part, but it's not the beginning of environmental destruction in the Americas. <laughs> 
And so I wanted to talk about invasive species. And so I have a couple of different examples on invasive species here. So the first one on the bottom is um, plantain. So I picked plantain because it's all over the United States. It's everywhere. It's all over California. If you don't know what this plant is, it's actually really, really incredible. So I do a little bit of like herbal remedies and stuff. I have an ecology background, so I'm into like plant science as well. But plantain is really great for your skin, actually. So this comes in like salves and soaps and lotions, but it's originally from Europe. And so um, in the book, Writing Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer calls this plant um, white man's footprints because it came with Europeans and sprung up everywhere. And basically like wherever they walked, this plant just sort of sprung up. So if you don't know what plantain is, that's the picture of plantain. I encourage you all to look off the ground when you go outside and see if you can spot it. Because once you see it once, you'll realize it's literally everywhere. And this plant in particular is actually a plant that um, some people call as naturalized to the environment. It doesn't really do a whole lot of harm to the environment. And it does a whole lot of good for people because you can use it for skin remedies, like I said. But it's still an invasive species as in it's not indigenous to these lands here. And even in the name white man's footprints, it alludes to that history. Another plant, though, that is very harmful to the land in the United States, especially in California, are eucalyptus trees. So eucalyptus trees originally are from Australia, an indigenous Black nation located um, in Asia. Those trees were taken by British colonizers to the Americas and planted because they were initially going to use them to build the railroads because the trees grow really fast and they're prolific and just spread out everywhere but their wood and their bark is actually not the best for railroads. So they abandoned that idea. But the trees sprung up up and down the coast of California. Eucalyptus trees are all over the state. I'm sure you all know this right now, but eucalyptus trees are an extreme fire hazard, like extreme. They have a really, really high level of um, volatile oils, which is why you use eucalyptus essential oil. And because of that, they basically combust like if a fire starts near them, the trees kind of explode in a way. And so in a state like California that has a huge wildfire problem, partially because we did not allow indigenous peoples to do regulated burns, we built homes and houses in areas that we probably shouldn't have built homes and houses in, and permanent structures, especially in areas that permanent structures should not be. And then we have this tree from Australia that isn't supposed to be here that basically explodes when it's caught on fire, you see the combination of the ways that colonization is destroying the environment in California and now making it very unlivable for a lot of people here. So I wanted to talk about that these two particular plants as examples of colonization and invasive species. Other examples include corn and sugarcane. And so corn, I'll start with that one first originally from the Americas, when it was transported to China, it fundamentally reshaped Asia because corn just sort of grew so quickly there and became like a really great source of food because it had such high nutritional content. It started to spread out all over Asia and it led to mass deforestation by transplanting a crop that wasn't originally from this place to Asia because of the transatlantic slave trade and that sort of triangular trade route. Um, sugarcane as well, originally from Asia, transplanted to the Americas, sugarcane spread out and became like the cash crop of colonization. And so you have these enslaved Black folks and Indigenous folks working sugarcane plantations. And so this image on the left corner is the Haiti, um, it's the Haiti Dominican Republic border. So on the right side where it's lush and green is Dominican Republic, on the left side is Haiti. And the difference in the landscape is because of the different methods that France and Spain use for plantation slave labor. France was a much more brutal regime, a slash and burn sort of way of clearing out farmland. Spain, not as much. There's also differences in like how they interacted with people based on race from a France colonial perspective and a Spanish colonial perspective. And you can see that clearly in the landscape. Haiti has lost a lot of forests in a lot of parts of it, while the Dominican Republic has flourishing forests. And that's all because of these methods and modes of colonization and enslavement. So I wanted to tie that in as well so you can clearly see how race is shaping the environment around us. So we're going to dive into this concept of environmental racism, switching gears slightly but still on the same track. What is environmental racism? So environmental racism refers to the disproportionate burden of environmental hazards in Black, Indigenous, and POC communities. 
A 2018 EPA study found that communities of color face on average a 28% higher health burden compared to the general population because of proximity to facilities emitting particulate pollutants. For Black Americans, that disproportionate health burden skyrocketed to 54% higher than the general population. Housing discrimination, the legacy of colonization and enslavement, income and wealth inequality, lack of green space, gentrification, and institutional racism all contribute to environmental health disparities. So there was a study that came out, I believe it was in like 1990, I wanna say, um, that said that race is the most significant predictor of a person living near contaminated air, water, or soil. This is, really groundbreaking because people tend to, especially in a conservation movement, talk about not wanting to pollute things or making sure that we keep the wildlife healthy and safe and safe as well. But are we talking about the ways that people of color are the ones that are having to deal with this burden of pollution? So colonization is something that happens both inside of a nation and outside of a nation. And housing discrimination and violence in that way is a form of internal colonization. It's a way of relegating people of color and indigenous peoples to the worst areas or the worst land or putting them intentionally next to factory farms and, and um, larger textile factories and polluted water systems. So like, for example, Flint, Michigan still does not have clean water. And it's been like over 10 years since the Flint, Michigan water crisis made national news. That's just one tiny example of environmental racism in the United States, but this is all over the world. And we see this on a large scale in terms of the way that climate change is going to impact communities of color. I, I believe that the World Bank estimates by 2050 that there will be 250 million climate migrants from Latin America, Africa, the Caribbean, and Asia migrating to North America and Europe. That's because climate change and the burdens of climate change are going to be disproportionately felt by people of color around the world, especially coastal peoples. Um, and pollution, like I said, is driven by colonization and the military plays a really big role in that. The US military is a bigger polluter than over 140 countries. In 2017, the US military bought about 269,000 barrels of oil a day and admitted 25,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide by burning those fuels. So I bring up the US military because we have bases all over the entire world. We very much shape the global politics of the world and we're also shaping the environmental consequences of our military occupation of these different nations everywhere. And so because of that, an example of that would be Hawaii. The military is currently polluting Hawaii's water supply and kind of denying it. So this is an image from folks in Hawaii protesting um, the shutdown, protesting and asking to shut down Red Hill, which is a military base in Hawaii that is polluting water. And so Hawaii is was colonized by the United States in 1898. It's an indigenous nation, part of the Pacific Islands, and the ways that borders have worked is that now Hawaii and other different island nations that were once part of this sort of collective community are separated by borders. You can't fly from Hawaii to Fiji to Tonga without a passport before you could just, they were all sort of part of one culture and community and you were able to be in, in contact and community with each other. And that was lost with the colonization of the Pacific Islands and the colonization and annexation of Hawaii. Hawaiians are still fighting for sovereignty, are still fighting for the rights to their lands, but because they are now part of the US empire, that they don't really have a lot of ground to stand on. And this is one of the very um, recent examples is the way that Hawaii's water supply is currently polluted by the US military. So I mentioned how colonization works internally as well as externally. And one of the ways that that works is housing discrimination and redlining. So there's a sign over here that says, we want white tenants in our white community. The legacy of redlining and housing discrimination is very much still relevant today. I live in Santa Barbara, a community that is 50% white and 50% Latino and like 2% black. So you see the ways that housing discrimination is impacting the the place that I currently live. Um, I used to live in the Pacific Northwest and there are lots and lots of deeds on houses that say things like, this house can never go to somebody who is black, Native American or Jewish. And so people I've known personally have had to go to court and take these deeds to court and say, hi, excuse me, we live in 2021, this is no longer um, legally able to be held up in court and have to argue that. 
but they're, they're just finding that out about these deeds because it's been all white people living in these homes for that long. Housing discrimination is very, very real. And we see the way that this plays out, like I said, in the way that environmental racism impacts folks of color. And so how this affects um, folks of color as well, not just in terms of where you're located in terms of toxic waste and pollution, also access to green space and nature and the environment. So black folks, even though we live in a lot of coastal cities, most of us don't actually have a lot of access to the oceans and it takes a long time to get to the oceans or a long time to get to the beaches. There was a UCLA study that calculated that if you lived away from the beaches in Southern California to go to the beach for an average weekend is gonna cost you maybe like 200 to $600 for a family of four if you're going to get a hotel and pay for parking and gas and all of that. So who can afford to, to spend 600 plus dollars to go visit the oceans if you don't have that type of money? Who has more access to wealth like systematically in this country and globally. So these are all things to think about when we talk about internal colonization and housing discrimination and how that impacts people of color's relationship to the environment. Um, this also plays out with indigenous reservation um, system throughout the United States. A lot of these reservations are not very coastal. Um, a lot of them are very insular, not always necessarily very close to bodies of water or close to some of the most beautiful parts of the um, American landscape, and that was also intentional as well. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation, but this is another form of internal colonization and sort of like housing discrimination as well. And so I wanted to give an example of how the legacy of racism, how housing discrimination plays out on the West Coast in Southern California specifically, because that's where I live. So I have to read my notes for this one, but Pacific Beach Club was in 1926. And this was a planned beach club for black residents in Huntington Beach. So I grew up in Orange County. So this, when I read Huntington Beach, I was like, I've been to Huntington Beach several times. And so they picked Huntington Beach because all of the LA beaches were under Jim Crow segregation. And so Huntington Beach was one of the few that wasn't because it was just outside of Los Angeles. And so they had this whole sort of, um, out like plan built up, right? They had architects, they had a whole plan to create this to be this huge black beach club. Different architects dropped out of the project. They were like, we don't wanna do this. We're not gonna build a beach club for black people. It took a long time to get it built. They, they had funders pull out. All of this stuff started happening because of pressure from the very white um, Orange County community that did not want this there in 1926. So it gets built, it's about to open, and then right before it's about to open, it's burned down by arsonists and the whole project is abandoned. All the funders pull out, none of the architects are willing to fix it. And so this Pacific Beach Club just ceases to exist just because the concept of building a beach club for black people in one of the few places where we could access the beach was just too much for white residents to handle. Another example is Bruce's Beach. And so Bruce's Beach, this was in 1912 and this was in Manhattan Beach. And there was a two block area in Manhattan Beach that was set aside for black residents. So Charles and Willa Bruce, who are pictured here, bought that property and were building it up to be basically one of these sort of like black beach hubs for black folks in the area. Um, so because they bought this property and they're like, okay, this is like one of the beaches that black people can come. They have like little food stands and cute stuff going on. So more black people start relocating to the area to be closer to the oceans and to be able to access this beach club. And so they were constantly threatened and harassed by white folks, Charles and Willa Bruce, constantly. Um, and so because of all the threats and the harassment, the city seized the property. It just took their land and said, you know what? You're causing too many problems for the residents of Manhattan Beach. So we're just going to take your property and we're gonna reincorporate it back into the city. So sorry, you don't have this anymore. Um, today, that land would have been worth over $75 million, right? So what does it mean to have black folks just lose their land because white folks don't want them in their communities and they don't want us to be on their beaches? And this, like I said, was one of the few beaches that black people could access in Southern California. They burned down Pacific Beach, they took the land from Bruce's Beach, and then we are to here today where people are like, why don't black people go to the beaches? There's a long history of violence against black people at 
at public swimming pools, violence against Black people in oceans and on the beaches, um, segregation in different communities. So what people would do is if there was a community pool, for example, they would say that the community pool was only available to people within this community. So if I lived in the neighboring Black community that has that is not in the white community, I could not come to that pool. No, you had to be a resident of this particular community to come to that pool. Or they would do things where it's like country clubs. That's where all these country clubs start popping up so they can make sure that recreation is just for white folks and that black folks can't enter the country club. So they have fees to go to the country club and they have they, they put them in gated communities only. You have to be a resident of this community to access our community pool. And then you end up with this long legacy of black people not knowing how to swim or not liking to swim as much, black folks not being able to buy beachfront property because examples like Charles and Willa Bruce who had beachfront property got taken from them. Um, a long legacy of housing discrimination. Um, like I said, the racial wealth divide, um, the racial wealth divide, the long legacy of housing discrimination, any sort of just sort of like economic exploitation against black folks going all the way back to enslavement, never got the three acres in the mule, never received reparations. And so how are we able to afford beachfront property and access to the oceans today? That's, that's why I wanted to ground us in the legacy of enslavement to begin with, so that we can understand how this trajectory impacts the very real ways that Black people access and relate to the oceans today. And so this is just illustrating um, the racial wealth divide and the home ownership gap. And this is from 1980s to about 2010, 2019. And so you see in the first image, the racial wealth divide. So from 1989 to 2019, you can see white wealth compared to black wealth and compared to Latino wealth, how much it has grown and how the disparities between the two have remained the same. Um, and in the other slide, um, you can see home ownership is heavily skewed towards white families. That is less than 50% of black families owning homes. And if you look at 1983 to 2016, that bar hasn't really changed. In fact, it's gone down slightly. So because you don't own homes, because you have this huge wealth divide and this wealth gap, because a lot of Black folks are burdened with student loans and debt, um, this all impacts our ability to do outdoor recreation, our ability to even have time to do recreation. If a lot of Black folks are in service industry jobs, then you're doing shift work. When are you going to take a vacation? When are you going to have time off? If you take time off, you're not getting paid, right? If you're an hourly worker, you're not going to get paid if you take time off. All of this contributes to the ways that we interact with the environment around us and who has the privilege of interacting with the environment around us. So now we're briefly going to touch on the history of conservation. So conservation began in the 19th century and it was really at its inception a way of preventing indigenous peoples from accessing land and to use that land for big game hunting and for white recreation. That's essentially the history of the conservation movement. And so there were a lot of the people on the board of these conservation organizations today are like big game hunters, wildlife poachers, um, people that are really into like um, mining and logging and all of that, they still sit on a lot of these boards of these like wildlife protection foundations because that's really what the inception of this was. It was to say that this is for fun and we wanna make sure that indigenous peoples aren't here. This is for white recreation. And so you see, especially in Africa today, a lot of indigenous peoples being removed from their land because they're doing wildlife protection and then they'll allow big game hunters into that same land. So it's just, it's a very complicated, system that is really built on the disenfranchisement of black and indigenous peoples. And so a lot of prominent racists and eugenicists actually founded the conservation movement in the United States. And that's what I'm gonna talk about here are two of the big ones, which one is John Muir and the other is Madison Grant. So the first is John Muir. And so he was known for his love of nature and conservation. I've been to Muir Woods in Northern California, but John Muir was also vehemently racist and designed the national park system to remove indigenous Americans from their land and to bar black people from entering so they could turn it into a money-making machine for white tourists. Muir referred to indigenous Americans as dirty and he founded the Sierra Club to be able to take upper middle-class white people mountaineering and to take back and conquer the wilderness. 
Um, black people were not allowed in most of the campsites or trails in national parks and national terrorism from park visitors prevented even more black folks from going. Um, conservationism as it was conceptualized in the West, like I said, is rooted in anti-indigeneity. So you have to bring in the views and the politics of the people who start these movements because objectivity doesn't exist. When I walk into a space, I don't leave my black perspectives behind. They come with me wherever I go. And so John Muir being very racist and wanting to create a way for white folks to access nature and to, without having to interact with indigenous people, then we don't wanna have black people staying in the same campsite as us. That's how the national park system sort of came to be. And then you have Madison Grant who branded himself as a wildlife zoologist. And he was instrumental in the creation of the Bronx Zoo. And the Bronx Zoo actually used to display African people in exhibits with monkeys. Um, and there's a very tragic story of Ota Benga, who I believe was from Congo. I could be wrong, but I believe he was from Congo and he was displayed in a cage with monkeys at the Bronx Zoo in New York City. So Madison Grant helped create that zoo. Um, he, Grant, along with President Roosevelt and John Muir were part of the founders of the American conservationism. And so he connected this idea of white superiority with the control and mastery of all living things on earth. So Grant wrote several books, including The Passing of the Great Race or The Racial Basis of European History, a book based on the pseudo science of eugenics, warning that the decline of the Nordic races. So according to Grant, the Nordic races were naturally superior and evidenced by natural selection and should be wary of the Alpine and Mediterranean races who threatened the Nordic existence. His work influenced the 1924 Immigration Act, which restricted immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe while banning immigration from Africa and Asia. Adolf Hitler himself wrote to Grant, expressing his deepest admiration for his work, calling Grant's book his Bible. Um, President Roosevelt also wrote to Grant, praising his book, calling it a capital book in purpose and vision and grasp of the facts of our people most need to realize. So Madison Grant is a terrible, terrible human being, but he is one of the fathers of the conservation movement. And so it's important to understand the history of conservationism in the United States, because ocean conservationism, though a separate entity from this general wildlife conservation, is birthed out of this. And so it's it's very clear why indigenous folks, black folks, other people of color have not been instrumental in these movements and are very much underrepresented in fields like biology and ecology and botany and any of these sort of natural sciences because a very long history of excluding folks of color from the start, from the very beginning. And so ocean conservation tends to really focus on like economics. Um, there's a lot of like making sure that like we can get some economic value from the way that we interact with the oceans, but it also tends to focus on like marine wildlife a lot, which is important as well because we have like this image of a sea turtle. It's one of those quintessential images of sea turtles sort of tangled up in some sort of plastic or netting or mesh. And so there is a lot of pollution, but it, it's hard to balance, right? You're trying to have an economic benefit to using the oceans while protecting wildlife and sometimes they just don't work sometimes you can't really meet in the middle if capitalism is one of the things that has destroyed the environment how are you going to find a way to sort of reform it or do a little bit but not too much and so that's sort of the trick with ocean conservation in particular it's like over the balance of overfishing versus underfishing and all of that and so ocean conservation really is a recent field that came to be around the 60s and 70s is when it really took off um, but for a long time, ocean conservation didn't really include the voices of coastal peoples from different indigenous and people of color backgrounds. And that is a huge oversight because like I said, indigenous peoples have been living in these lands for hundreds of thousands of years and have some of the most intimate knowledge of marine ecology and coastal ecology there is. And because these conservationist movements were founded by white supremacists, indigenous peoples have been left out of the conversation from the beginning. And it's really a shame because they are going to be the most impacted by climate change, by coastal degradation, and are still the most impacted by climate change and coastal degradation. Okay, these images are not loading, which is a shame because they're very important. Let me see if I can refresh. Okay, you can see it here, which is weird. I make it big. Okay, I'll make it small so you all can kind of see it. But um, 
there is a proposed national marine sanctuary by the Chumash. And so I wanted to pull these screenshots because it says that this is the first tribally nominated sanctuary. The fact that this is one of the first tribally nominated sanctuaries when the land that we're on belongs to indigenous peoples is absurd to me, but that is just honestly the very sad reality of the way that the environmental movement has just functioned for the past couple hundred of years. And so I just wanted to talk about this very briefly, but um, yeah, there's a marine sanctuary proposed by the Chumash, which is right off the coast of where I'm currently living in Santa Barbara. And it says that the California Chumash people and other tribes have stewarded this land and water since time immemorial. These ways of knowing and being supported abundant thriving ecosystems for thousands of years and there's critical need for state and federal conservation managers to partner with indigenous knowledge holders to ensure a sustainable future for California's ocean and beyond. The international commitment to protect and conserve at least 30% of the world's lands, freshwater and oceans by 2030 needs an understanding of indigenous perspectives to effectively and equitably manage protected areas over time. And so I just wanted to bring in this very brief um, perspective from Chumash folks and their attempt to um, create a marine sanctuary off the coast of Santa Barbara. And so now we are briefly going to talk about the bi POC view of the Anthropocene. And this is really honestly more of like a black and indigenous view of the Anthropocene, but it's this concept known as black radical ecology, which essentially places the onus on white society, particularly rich white society, arguing that the term Anthropocene places undue blame on the black slash third world. So essentially what they're getting at here is how at the beginning, if you go back to the definition of environmental colonialism, Black and indigenous folks didn't really have any autonomy in the transatlantic slave trade. If that is the beginning of the Anthropocene, we did not play any consensual role in any of that process. So white supremacy is destabilizing the earth, not humanity. The fear of this apocalyptic end to humanity caused by environmental degradation is new to richer, wider parts of the world, but black and indigenous people have lived in a constant state of environmental degradation and existential annihilation since the beginning of the modern globalized era. So like I said, um, the genocide of indigenous peoples, the displacement of African peoples, the destruction of our ecosystems, environmental racism, um, not being able to access green space, all of that is just a reality that Black and Indigenous peoples have been living with. It's just now impacting wider areas of the world. Um, according to the World Bank, 140 million people from Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia are expected to be displaced from climate impacts by 2050. Forces of colonialism, capitalism, and white supremacy have enslaved us, murdered us, taken our land, decimated our resources, incarcerated us, and impoverished us. Yet black and indigenous voices are often left out of the conversation. We've been advocating for the destruction of capitalism, for our lands to be free from imperial forces and for the end of enslavement since the very beginning. And so that's sort of a, a, a black view on this climate collapse that we're experiencing is like, we've already been experiencing climate collapse. You just haven't felt it yet. We've been feeling it this entire time. I am in the United States because of the legacy of enslavement, not because of immigration or any sort of conscious decision on the part of my ancestors. That was a very unconscious, non-consensual choice. And if that transport of my ancestors is leading to the destruction of the lands of indigenous peoples in America, what, like, what does that mean, right? That's what I want you all to take away from this talk is like, if this is the root of, of the destruction of the environment, what are we going to do to undo that? How do we fix that? How do we work with the people who have been experiencing the violence and the, and the economic and ecological fallout of white supremacy? How do we understand that? And how do we work to build a world where that doesn't exist anymore? So there's lots of different movements from different folks around the world. Um, there's a land back movement from indigenous folks essentially calling for their land back, <laughs> for lack of a better term, but also just general sovereignty over their land, being able to make decisions over their land, decide how to use the land and not use the land in the ways that they want to, what parts are going to be used for economic benefit, what parts are going to be preserved and how you do that. Um, a lot of this movement is connected to the water protector movement, which a lot of these movements, I should say, are led by indigenous folks that are women, that are two-spirit, that are trans and non-binary. There's a lot of like non-men leadership in this movement, which is really powerful and incredible. Um, but yeah, it's very connected to water protectors, um, connected to stopping pipelines from going through indigenous land and polluting water sources. 
So that's like one tiny piece of indigenous action in this movement. Um, there's a lot of Chicano history as well, a lot of farm worker rights. So I have Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez doing, Cesar Chavez doing a lot of farm worker activism in California. Um, it's important to bring in like a Chicano and farm worker perspective as well, because though you all focus on ocean conservation, the ecosystem isn't segmented, right? The things that happen on farms impact what happens in our oceans as well. And so being able to bring in these other perspectives is really important, but this is just examples of how other people of color have been advocating and been at the forefront of environmental movements, even if we aren't always included in traditional ways. There's a lot of black folks doing a lot of um, returning to the land, um, a lot of talks about food sovereignty as well in black communities. So black people are actually more likely to be vegan than anyone else. We're three times higher likely to be vegan than most people. So we do a lot of sort of like um, finding different ways to disentangle ourselves from oppressive systems like factory farming that lead to polluting and the way that they treat immigrant workers and low income workers and a lot of farms and black farms and Afro indigenous farms popping up around the country trying to reconnect with land trying to reclaim ancestral traditions that were stolen or taken from us or that we didn't have the ability to practice openly and so that's a whole movement as well. So briefly touching on a path forward, where do we go from here. Well, I want to say that I cannot tell you how to solve racism or colonialism or environmental collapse. That's not something that I can just sum up in a quick little presentation. But I do hope that you start to think about the different intersections and the different identities of people that you work with. Do you have um, a diversity of voices and opinions across race, class, gender, language, age, nationality, citizenship and documentation status, mental and physical ability, religion or lack thereof, social sexual orientation and housing and sheltered status? Are all of these people represented within the Marine Protected Areas Collaborative Network? Do you have folks that are houseless working with you and how their relationship to the coast is um, thought about because where I live in Santa Barbara, for example, there's a lot of sweeps of houseless people off the beaches. So have you included houseless voices and how you talk about ocean conservation and marine conservation and what the oceans mean to them? Are you including people um, of different languages, people who speak indigenous languages, not just Spanish, for example, but people who are speaking languages from all over the world? Are you including people of different racial backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different class backgrounds? All of this needs to be included in a robust way to address ocean conservation. Otherwise, you're going to have a very one-sided, very narrow viewpoint of how to conserve the oceans, how to work with different peoples up and down the coast. You need to have this sort of robustness in the people that work at your organizations in order to have the best strategy moving forward. And so there's three sort of main pillars, diversity, racial equity, and inclusion. So I'm just going to briefly define what those are. Um, diversity includes all the ways in which people differ, and it encompasses all the different ca characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. It is all inclusive and recognizes everyone and every group as a part of the diversity that should be valued. A broad definition includes not only race, ethnicity, and gender, the groups that most often come to mind when the term diversity is used, but also age, national origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, education, marital status, language, and physical appearance. It also evokes different ideas, perspectives, and values. So when you're thinking about how diversity can play a role in making ocean conservation more robust and increasing people's access to the oceans to begin with, I, I think bringing in folks with different disabilities as well is really important because are the oceans even accessible? Is it something that folks with disabilities can access? And if we know that, for example, I think it's one in four black people have a disability, that's just going to further disenfranchise black communities if the coasts aren't accessible to folks with disabilities. How is, are there ramps that go from the parking lot to the shore so that you can push a wheelchair because you can't push a wheelchair through the sand? Things like that are why you need to have a diverse group of perspectives when you're coming up with ways to tackle problems like ocean conservation or access to ocean space. Racial equity um, refers to what a genuinely non-racist society would look like. In a racially equitable society, the distribution of society's benefits and burdens would not be skewed by race. In other words, racial equity would be a reality in which a person is no more or less likely to experience society's benefits or burdens because of their membership in a particular racial group. So how I mentioned earlier that race is the most significant predictor of being um, located next to some sort of toxic waste site, that's an example of racial inequity. 
a racially equitable world would be like, race is not a predictor of any of these things. But in fact, race today and the world that we live in is the most significant predictor for most of the burdens experienced by people in society. So how are we going to work together to figure out ways to alleviate that burden, to dissipate that burden and spread it out so that it's equitable, that it's a, it's a toss up whether or not anybody lives next to a toxic waste site or we just get rid of toxic waste sites in general. But essentially that's what racial equity is aiming for. Um, and so there's lots of movements um, that are geared towards addressing racial equity. Um, one of the most famous ones is the Black Lives Matter movement, but also movements for climate refugees and immigrant movements as well. Um, thinking about the ways that, like I said, colonization and the legacy of imperialism is impacting different communities of color around the world and leading to a lot of these climate migrants. How are we going to address that issue and how does that pertain to ocean conservation and access to ocean space as well? And then inclusion, which is the act of creating environments in which any individual or group can be and feel welcomed, respected, and supported and valued to fully participate. An inclusive and welcoming climate embraces differences and offers respect and words and actions for all people. So it's you have inclusion, you have diversity, you have racial equity. Inclusion is a piece where people are actually feeling like they're included. You don't want to do things that are tokenizing where you're like, oh, let's just bring in this person so that we can say that we brought this person in. Like they need to be fully able to participate. And so being able to fully participate means being able to say things from their perspectives without being tone policed or being shot down or being written off. Being able to say things from their perspective and have you say, okay, I, I didn't hear this. I wanna hear what you have to say. Like taking a step back and letting other folks lead. Are you actively including people from different backgrounds, from different, um, religions, cultures, different education levels as well. Is is Are all of the positions within your organization, do you only have to have a bachelor's degree to work at your organization? Are there other ways of creating knowledge systems outside of academia? Because if there aren't, then what does that mean for people who don't have access to academia? These are all things that you all should be thinking about when you're thinking about building inclusive environments, um, especially when you're talking about um, racial and, and ethnic diversity. So that is the end. I feel like I finished early. Oh, I finished about on time. So that's the end. So we have a little bit of time for Q and A, and then um, yeah, but that's everything. I hope you all enjoyed. Abrupt end. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. That was amazing. Thank you so much. And I think we do have some questions. I know Jules Jackson. I think you had your hand up. Is there a way to have either put it in the chat or allow her to ask her question? Question for our tech people. Oh, awesome. I see she's, she's on there now. Jules, if you want to unmute, you can go ahead and talk. Maybe. So while we're trying to figure out the technical, I'll just say thank you again. That was really, really, really well done. I think you started with the overview and um, I know I really, really appreciated that background. And it looks like, oh, just accidentally tapped hand raised. Okay, thanks Jules. I appreciate that. Just wanted to give you the chance to ask a question if you would like to. Um, but for everybody else, feel free to, to put something in the Q&A or the chat um, if you have a question for, for Gabrielle while we have her. So far, Gabrielle, it's just amazing feedback. Lots of yays. <laughs> yes, awesome. I feel like I talked really fast. I was like, oh, geez. Speeding through this. <laughs> no, it was it was very good. Um, still scrolling through here. You all can also feel free to like email me questions as well. Um, Kala, Aubrey, and Nicole all have my contact information. So if you ever need to get in touch with me for anything, please feel free. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is that's a good point, Kent. I think we're all always trying to figure out how to cover so much material in a short period of time. 
Um, you know, the good news is that her presentation, we missed a little bit of her introduction, but the rest is recorded uh, to view it over. And just to remind everyone, this is just the first, the first in a series. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to get more information. This isn't a, a one and done. So we'll be able to hear from Gabrielle and our just community colleagues um, next month and the month after as well. Okay, I see a question from, people are still digesting. Let's see, um, Erica said, a lot of your slides said do not duplicate, but they had so much useful text that I was able to fully absorb as fast as they were covered. Will we have access to review them afterwards? Um, so yeah, the presentation is recorded. I can put together sort of like a key terms sheet and send that to Cal and Nicole as well so they can distribute that with people who came to the workshop. But hopefully that will help you. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, so we'll have just a key terms and then also you can look at the recording um, over, but Gabrielle just asked obviously not to duplicate her slides. Um, and then let's see. I just saw one. Oh, do you have next steps training on, on implementing a lot of the information we, we heard today? Yeah, so some of that will be covered in some of the later workshops of the series, especially the language workshops that you all will have a chance. So I know that they sent out, Cal and Nicole and Aubrey have sent out the um, registration form already. So go ahead and take a look at that again, because there's some language workshops coming up in the next couple of months that are going to dive into how to create sort of like inclusive language communities. And then there's also a workshop on diversifying community outreach and engagement. And so those two workshops are going to touch a little bit more on the implementation aspect. Great. And here's another one. So in general, what do you do if your organization is genuinely afraid of being asked to give its land back? I would ask what you're afraid of and why you're afraid. That's what I would ask first, but I think that there are rematriation programs all across the country. Um, and I think that I'm not the best person to sort of sit and tell you how to respond to that question. I think indigenous folks whose land they would be, you would be giving it back to are the best to answer that question. But I would really push you and your organization to sit with why you're afraid of giving that land back and what you're afraid of. Like, what does that mean to give land back and why are you scared to do it? Great, here's another good question. I think there's increasing understanding of the need to include more diverse voices in decision-making, et cetera, but also increased emphasis on paying people for their work and not expecting people to volunteer their time. Do you have any suggestions for navigating this in situations where funding is not available to pay people for their time? It's a great question. That's a really good question. And I think that's something that like, even we struggle with at Just Communities as a nonprofit, we're a really small team. And so funding is always something that's like difficult for us. But I would, I would find creative ways to essentially pay people for their time. Like people should be paid for their labor. This is definitely like labor, even if you're talking about things from your lived experience, it's a lot of work to get up in front of a group of people and like explain yourself to people. It's, it's exhausting sometimes. So I would look for creative ways to pay people. If you can't physically give people like a, a really fat stipend, like even like a gift card to some place, like, like a, like a dinner gift card or or some, some sort of like little small token of appreciation should be shared. If it doesn't, if it can't be a big monetary appreciation then something small, but being honest with people up front too about your budget, just being like, listen, I would like to pay you X amount of money. We only have this money in the budget. I know that this is going to be a lot of work for you and being okay with sometimes hearing no and hearing people say, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't come and speak at this event because I know that I'm worth X, Y, Z more and I can make that someplace else. So it's, it's definitely challenging, but I would definitely say that try to find some creative way to honor people's time and commitment, even if it's a small gift. Great, thank you. Another question, historical context of black folks and families being excluded from the beach areas and communities is helpful. Many of us take outdoor recreation for granted. Do you have tips or advice on how to introduce or frame beach or outdoor activities for students or program participants from historically excluded communities so it may increase enjoyment or engagement? Another good one. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. There's some organizations um, by Black folks that are trying to do just that up and down the coast of California, but also throughout the country. So I would start there. I would start looking wherever you are located locally for examples of different Black organizations that are trying to bring Black or um, youth of color to the oceans or to the mountains or to other recreation places. Um, and then I would also just sort of do, start in like really small ways. I think if you talk to young people and children, that's like the best way to get them interested in the outdoors and nature. So um, I used to work at the Reef at Santa Barbara, which is the research education, research experience and education facility. Um, it was like a touch tank. And so we had a lot of young elementary school kids, predominantly Latino youth coming to these touch tanks. And I was like one of the first people to introduce them to ocean ecology, for example. So little um, events or excursions or things where you can do that with young people is a really great way to just get them interested in the natural world around them. But then you also have to understand that there are going to be family and economic barriers to how they experience the oceans in particular. So for example, my mom doesn't swim. So when I was a kid, I, she wanted me to be enrolled in swim classes. I took swim classes, but if there was ever, if I was ever, if I ever needed help in the pool, she couldn't help me, right? So that was like a big fear and a big barrier of hers for like wanting me to go to pool parties by myself, for example, because she was like, I, I just feel uncomfortable with the idea of you swimming. So it's, you have to understand that there's a lot of like trauma and cultural um, background that is going to need to be like worked through. So it might not just be like an easy, like jump into this, but I would say like, like I said, working with kids and different organizations that already do this type of work would be the best route to go. Great, now now we got, now you guys have processed some of this, we got a lot of good questions coming in. Um, so there's a question, interest about learning more about Black Radical Ecology and do you have recommendations for sources or orgs to continue learning? And then I will just add before you answer real quick that a lot of people are putting links to um, different organizations or other sources of information in the chat as well. So it looks like we're already sharing amongst ourselves. So that's, that's great, but go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of different um, resources and organizations and information out there. I would say one of the best ways to interact with like a particular version of Black Radical Ecology is to look at Soul Fire Farms resources. And I'll type that in the chat so that you all know. That was actually the image of the Black farmers that I use. So this for everyone, Soul Fire Farm. Um, they have a very um, in-depth and robust perspective on an Afro-Indigenous relationship to the land. And so that's just one concrete example of people doing like hands-on stuff. And I mentioned Soul Fire Farm because they also do a series of workshops and trainings as well, but a lot of it is focused on um, um, inequality in the food systems and uprooting racism within the food systems as well. And so I think that, is like a really good place to start is with some of their resources and their workshops and the work that they've done. Um, Leah Penniman, who is in charge of Soul Fire Farm, has given a lot of talks. Um, she's also somebody, she's of Black and Jewish descent and is like reconnecting with her culture and her heritage in that way. And so she brings in a lot of really diverse perspectives and how she talks about sort of the Black relationship to the land around us. So I would look up like podcasts and videos of Leah Penniman and then just Soul Fire Farm's work in general. Great. And then just reading, Jules Jackson also wanted to chime in with hashtag lamb back from her point of view, comes in a variety of forms, including stewardship, economic control, decision making power and supporting of local indigenous nations. And she put the link to landback.org um, and what you can do and what is land back. So great. Thank you for sharing that, Jules. Um, another question in the chat. How do you stay positive and engaged with the efforts of environmental conservation when we have these really large scale problems like white supremacy and capitalism that make it so hard to even make any tiny bit of headway on environmental issues? This is gonna be a hard question. I often feel like my work can't succeed while these huge systemic problems um, exist and hard to know where to put my efforts. I guess it's all interrelated, but I'd be grateful for some words of wisdom. Yeah, that's, I think that is the question of people who, who care about multiple things going on in the world. If you care about issues of race and the environment and housing inequality and any of these other things, you're like, how do I do my job while also staying hopeful when I feel like I'm just doing a tiny bit of something and it's not making as big of an impact? It's, 
it's difficult for like lack of a of a good answer to make you feel better it's just it's hard but hope is the only thing that brings us forward and it's important that whatever you're doing in your work you're rooted in this idea of like radical love you're doing this because you deeply deeply love and care about the oceans and the people's access to the oceans or whatever it is that you are deeply passionate about you have to be grounded in love and you have to use that to propel yourself forward even when you feel unhopeful even when you feel angry as long as the root of that anger and that root of of hopelessness is coming from a place of like I just really want the best for everyone I think that's at least what I use to propel me forward um I also recommend reading Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer because that book is is really incredible <laughs> it's absolutely amazing and I'm I tend to be a pretty nihilistic person where I'm like very doom and gloom but reading Robin's words really inspires me because she's a botanist and she's from an indigenous background and so she brings in all these really complex ideas and still manages to find some sort of like positive outlook or a hopeful spin on it. So I think that that is some of the best advice that I can give, but also just being in community, like not trying to do this work all on your own. Like you all work within this huge um, marine protected areas collaborative network. So you have all of these connections to people up and down the coast, but expanding that to local organizations that are doing stuff with black youth or indigenous youth or Latino youth, getting to know your surrounding community and working in different ways so that you're not trying to solve all of the problems. You're connected to people who are solving other portions of the problems or working to mitigate other portions of the problem. I think that's the best way to answer that question. Great. How do you recommend hiring committees go about hiring more diver diverse groups of people while not doing it just to fill some diversity quota? Any suggestions? Yeah, that's a very loaded question, but I think I would say reevaluating what is actually necessary to do the role that you're looking for. I think baseline, some of the parameters that you put into like a, a job description can already be eliminating and discriminatory or already lean towards one group of people over the other. So if you really don't need, for example, like an administrative role, do you really need a bachelor's degree to answer telephones? Probably not. So then why is that necessary on your application if you know that there is a barrier of access to higher education for certain communities, right? So maybe remove that as a requirement for that particular position. If you, or add other positions, like maybe you do need some marine ecologist and you need to have a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in ecology or environmental sciences, but can you also have another position where you're bringing in the sort of cultural elements and religious element of oceans for West African diasporic peoples. Maybe you just create a position like that and they work together. You don't need a background in ecology to talk about that particular aspect, or you do the same thing with indigenous folks. It's about being creative with what you're actually trying to do and then taking a look at what requirements are necessary and what requirements aren't necessary. Also looking at like the culture of your organization. Does your organization have a culture that maybe is in conflict with other cultures, there's not the most welcoming to other cultures. How can you like mitigate that? Um, and then also just thinking of thinking of ways to when you're in the hiring process and you're actually meeting people, not jumping to conclusions very quickly. We tend to write people off really fast if they hesitate on an answer or they don't answer questions fully, but like trying to get rid of all of those sort of background things that are in your head about how you think a good candidate should perform and just honestly and listen to the content of what they're saying. Um, an example of this is when I was hiring for a position when I was an undergrad, one of the um, applicants cried in the middle of her interview. She was painfully shy and just started crying and we were a little bit thrown, but I was like, her answers were good. She was just really nervous and we hired her and was incredible at the position. So thinking of things like that, like don't throw out people because they've acted in a particular way that you don't like or were confused by, listen to the content of what they're saying. Great. Any recommendations on starting these kinds of conversations with people who don't have much background or experience with racial justice and DEAI issues, particularly older white folks? Yeah, that's always tricky and challenging. I would just start the conversations. I, I'm, I'm very much like rip the bandaid off and just start the types of conversations. You can definitely talk about things in a way that 
isn't as jarring perhaps to some people without watering things down to the point where you're now losing meaning. And I think that's a struggle for a lot of these DEI organizations is that they're trying to sort of toe the line of like, I wanna make sure that I get this information across, but I, I don't wanna make people feel uncomfortable. People are gonna feel uncomfortable. It's a very uncomfortable history. I, as a black person feel uncomfortable, even though slavery was taught in school in a very sanitized way, every time it came up, it didn't make me feel less awkward or uncomfortable. That's just part of these conversations. And like, we're all, I think here we're all adults. And so we should be able to dive into complicated and uncomfortable topics without that just, oh, I, I don't want to hear this, or I, I'm not ready for that. We, we have to be able to like model the behavior that we claim we want children to follow with each other. And that is being able to sit down and listen and have a conversation that's difficult and challenging and that pushes us further. That's great. Yeah, comfortable with being uncomfortable and then just the baby steps. I like that, making that first step. I think there's a kind of a follow-up question to that um, that says, you know, so once you've started the dis discussion, how um, can you provide input on how white folks can avoid falling into the pitfalls of feeling pressured into a sense of urgency? So yeah, I think the, the sense of urgency is really something that is a product of the sort of like media landscape that we live in as well. I would say that like, we live in this 24 hour news cycle that is constantly reporting on something. And if you're somebody who uses social media a lot, like I do, there's like, con as soon as news breaks, you see infographics all over social media talking about it. I would say that there is power in resting and reflecting and taking time to actually think about what you're saying before you say it. And I think that that's something that white folks do, but also folks of color as well, this, this need, because we have a culture of, I have to say something now. If I don't say something, it means that I, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And that's not true. And so what you end up when you're in this sort of sense of urgency is a lot of really empty, meaningless statements. Like, for example, during all of the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, uh, every organization, random organizations were putting out statements about their commitment to Black lives because they felt like they needed to say something instead of sitting and reflecting and being like, why are we saying this? What is What goal am I trying to achieve by putting this statement on my website? What is the purpose of this? So like just sitting and thinking and digesting before you put something out, consulting different groups of people, having other people proofread whatever statement or project or program you're thinking about implementing and look through and figure out what is the actual goal that I want to achieve and being honest about that, honest about why you're doing something. Am I doing this just because I don't want to be seen as racist? Am I doing this because I feel like we need to do a diversity thing and we have to do it because we haven't done it? Like sit with the goal and try to understand is your goal actually to help or to work with black and indigenous peoples because if it's not then maybe now is not the time to put out that statement or to put that program together or whatever yeah that's great advice and i feel like a lot of people are going to resonate with the fact that a lot of our work is associated with grant deliverables and feeling that pressure to get things done and sitting back and reevaluating what the true purpose is and then maybe looking ahead and making sure there's more time associated with this work when you do um, go after grant and funding support to do it. Um, Chen Chen asks, are you familiar with any good examples of environmental organizations taking steps to be more inclusive, reaching out to and empowering diverse communities, incorporating broader perspectives, providing education and outreach that speak to people of different backgrounds. So good examples. Yeah, there's there's several different organizations that I will send, when I send the um, key terms, I'll include like a list of different organizations because it's going, it's going to take me a second to come up with different names off the top of my head. But there are several different orgs across the country, especially I would say if you look into organizations that are um, focus on environmental activism for folks of color about bringing black youth and youth of color to nature. I would say that there's a, a lot of work there, but also folks that are interested in sort of um, herbal healing and medicine. There's a lot of like people reclaiming traditional practices in that aspect. And so then there's like a sort of black and indigenous reconnection to land aspect from those different organizations as well. So I would say be creative when you're doing this type of research. And like I said, I'll, I'll send that in a PDF to Cal, Nicole and Aubrey, 
but be creative and think outside of the box. Like I, I would say, don't just automatically look up like black environmental organizations, but think of like, okay, what other aspects of culture or religion could be connected to the environment and then look into that because I guarantee you there's a lot of like indigenous and black and people of color organizations that are trying to reconnect to nature through different avenues. So it's it's like a really broad scope, which is why it's it's hard for me to come up with like a list right now, but I'll send I'll send some examples over. Great. And then I know we talked a little bit about your slides and sharing, but I think this question is um, where the concern comes from. So besides preventing plagiarism, plagiarism, is there a concern of work done by the BIPOC communities not being given proper credit from others? Yeah, that happens all the time, like all the time. I would say that that is sort of the foundation of a lot of the social movements that we are in today. Um, there's a lot of, Angela Davis is really famous in her book, Women, Race and Class, where she talks about how the conception of the modern feminist movement was really built off of the backs of black women, for example. And so all of these concepts about entering the workforce, for example, during feminism, like black women have always been in the workforce. Um, Sojourner Truth, if you all don't know, um, is famous for her speech, Ain't I a Woman? So this, these are just examples of how the work and the legacy of black and indigenous activism is sort of co-opted on like a larger historical scale, but then this happens just on a day to day, like people will post videos on TikTok, for example, and then somebody will screenshot it and not have that person's handle in it. Something as small as that to as big as just the erasure of the ways that black people were instrumental in like the gay rights movement or the environmental movement, et cetera. So it's, it's a really long legacy from big to small actions. And I think that's why it's important a, to have like a actual black person or person of color deliver the information themselves instead of having other people deliver it for them. But then if you do take things from other people to credit them. And I think that that's something that comes from a lot of like um, indigenous practices. And I, I'm using indigenous as like a global term for people who are indigenous globally. Um, this idea of sorting paying homage to your teachers. Like um, it's, it's a, it's something that is integral to the practices that I do. If I am going to go and give a talk about African spirituality, I have to pay homage to my teachers who taught me. I, I'm like not culturally allowed to give that talk if I don't. And I think that's a concept that isn't really rooted necessarily in Western culture of saying, oh, I got this from this person who got this from that person. Everybody wants to be like the inventor or the creator or the, the person who did this thing instead of saying like, hey, I." put this together, I compiled these resources, but these resources are not from me. So I had quotes from other people in that presentation and I made sure to be like, okay, this is from Marcus Garvey. This is from Ami Cesare. This is from Robbie Robinson. Like to make sure that I'm saying like, yeah, I'm the one who compiled this all together, but this, I would not be able to be here without the contributions of these people. And that's something that isn't typically afforded to black folks and other folks of color. Great, and I do want to highlight this comment um, that says, thank you for the comment on paying people for their knowledge. On a number of occasions, there's a request for tribal knowledge and input, and there's rarely a discussion of compensation from those requesting it. That's, that's really great feedback for all of us just to incorporate it all into our, our daily work. Yeah, and I, and I would say for any like people of color out there who have like side gigs or get asked to talk for things like this, like know what your worth is as well. I think um, for some people who you get excited that people are just including you. You're like, oh my goodness, I have this opportunity to speak on this thing. Don't do it for free. <laughs> That's what I would say to all people of color. Don't, don't do it for free. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it could be an honor depending on what it is that you're doing. You could be excited. It could be groundbreaking that you've been asked to come to this thing or to speak at this event, but make sure that you get paid what you're worth because there's a really, really long history of like underpaying folks of color, underpaying people who are younger, underpaying folks with disabilities. So making sure that if somebody is asking you to come and give your time and speak to your experience, which like I said, is, is labor, it's still work that you get paid what you're worth. And if they can't afford to pay you what you're worth, that they're giving you some sort of compensation in some way, even if it's a small gift, because I don't think money has to be at the base of everything, but like, bake me a cake or something. Like, do so show me that you cared about what I did in some way. I don't know if you want me to bake you a cake. That's what <laughs> <laughs> 
to be a bad idea by making <laughs> stuff that's okay. Um, I do want to give an opportunity just for, for any of our tribal partners or members on um, the call, if you guys had anything um, to add from your perspective or experiences um, to share with the, uh, the, our participants on the call, um, would like to give you that, that space to do that now since we got 12 more minutes left. So go ahead and, and raise your hand if you're interested. We already had a couple perspectives um, from our tribal partners in the chat, seconding the definitely reimbursement for, for knowledge and participation um, and appreciating your presentation and seconding the respect and honor of ancestors as well. And no pressure if not to. Great, and Ruthie says she appreciates your, your presentation and insights, so all good news. Are there any questions I may have missed? Raise your hand now. This is great. I really appreciate all these very, very thoughtful questions. Your answers were excellent, Gabrielle, um, and I'm just excited to keep moving forward. I think, um, you know, I was thinking this was a baby step, but I actually think we made a pretty big step today. And I think we learned a lot. It'll take us a while to really um, kind of chew on it and process it. Um, and there might be more questions in, in the future. But like I said, this is, this is one in a series. Um, so we'll continue making progress. And I just, yeah, ask you guys to, to think about how you can apply it to your work in your own lives. and be prepared for, for the next for the next session um, and diving a little bit deeper. So thank you, Gabrielle and Just Communities team. I just really appreciate the, the time you spent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it as well. And again, you um, can get my contact information. I'll send over those key terms and some examples of different organizations. And you will see me and some of my other coworkers at future workshops. So thank you all. Great, thank you. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you.